Mel Hertig began in the fur business, then became a bookseller, started reading and traveling across this country, and gradually came to understand the real meaning of being a Canadian. Today, he's a publisher and a star Canadian nationalist. My guest is Mr. Mel Hertig, and our subject, a politician without a home. Mel Hertig, you were born in Edmonton, and it's always a pleasure to have a Westerner on the program uh, because it's altogether too rare. Hmm. And I thought we might begin by you giving us some kind of Western perspective on the state of union in Canada now. In 1972, you said that uh, Western separatism was a uh, something invented by one or two percent of the very rich in the West. Today, you say it's becoming a real possibility. There, there has been a, a very important change in the last little while, and uh, I don't know whether you could pin it down to the fact that there's an increasing conservative trend in Western Canada, and in fact, the uh, in Ottawa, you don't have a conservative government. I think also the fact that uh, a lot of people in the West have been feeling enormously frustrated because they don't feel properly represented in Ottawa. Having said that, Mike, look, uh, 90% of the people that I know in Western Canada, and I travel a lot right across the provinces, uh, the four Western provinces, are really great patriotic Canadians. And they're Canadians first, and then Albertans or Manitobans or what, what have you, second. Right. The Montreal Star, Mel, uh, some time ago, sent a reporter out to, to Western Canada. He did four articles, and uh, he said a lot of things, but one thing stands out in my memory, and that's the growing anti-Quebec, anti-French feeling he found in the West that they're tired of the French language being what he called <laughs> jammed down their throats. Well, gosh, you know, we hear so much about that right across the country. We hear uh, <coughs> people in Alberta, where I come from, we hear a great deal of talk about people in Ontario not being happy about the business of French being jammed down the throat. On, on the other hand, I just honestly believe that it's been overemphasized, that very, very few people really feel that way, that the people who do feel that way receive a great deal of attention. Uh, having said that, I wonder if Mr. Spicer hasn't been right if the uh, approach that we should take to this question is to try to get the kids... I just came back from Sweden recently. Mm -hmm. Three different languages in the school system uh, are, are used and employed, and the children think nothing of the fact of knowing English, knowing German, Many of them know uh, Norwegian equally well, as well as their own language. I think, uh, Mike, um, the whole business of regional alienation has been exacerbated by a, a lot of very, very active people who are uh, much noisier than, than uh, perhaps uh, they should be. Do you feel that's equally true for the, what we hear is the anti-Trudeau feeling, uh, strong anti-Trudeau feeling out west? Uh, do you think that's also <coughs> just a, a media topic that's been exaggerated? Well, the public opinion polls pretty well demonstrate what the situation is. Uh, Mr. Trudeau is very, very unpopular. If Mr. Trudeau doesn't make some pretty important changes in the relatively <coughs> near future, Mike, Mr. Trudeau is not going to be the prime minister of this country very quickly. Do you think the French aspect of Mr. Trudeau's uh, platform is, to a large degree, the uh, source of this anti-Trudeau feeling in the West? I, I think that's part of it, but I, do, I think, uh, all right. The Prime Minister has, unfortunately, in the last couple of years, come across as a relatively arrogant man. He's come across as relatively unfeeling. A lot of his policies have not been um, popular policies. I think he's had a relatively weak cabinet. And the Prime Minister is, is uh, in big trouble because of his policies more so than because of the French fact. Yes, sir. Growing up in the West, I had James Gray here last year, a prairie westerner. He suggested that because the, the time of the formation of the West was different, the patterns of settling were different, that the Westerner really doesn't have any feeling for that period of the Battle of the Plains of Abraham and oh. the history that immediately followed that. And 
Part of the sense of alienation with a lot of our history, Quebec and Ontario, is foreign to the Westerner. I think that's true. Did you feel that growing up? <clears throat> you know, one of the one of the things that you recognize when you're out there is uh, how incredibly recent the history of that part of the world is. Um, we just uh, had uh, John Diefenbaker recently tell the story of how, when he was a young boy, he sat on the knee of Gabriel Dumont, the famous Métis chief, the right-hand man of Louis Riel in the rebellion of 1885, and that's that's the beginning, really, of Western of Western history before the the uh, the, uh, the native people, or I should say, after the native people. Uh, the the history of the West is incredibly recent. There is a fantastic pioneer spirit out there. And where, where I live, Mike, in Edmonton, there are still older people who remember fleeing from Indians uh, as, as children with their parents, wow. if you can imagine. So, in fact, in, in the eastern part of British Columbia, there are parts of the history of that, that part of Canada that are only maybe 75 years old. I know a lot of people in the West, for instance, when they come out to Ontario, or they come out to the Maritimes in particular, and they look in the, if they ever go, get the opportunity to go and visit a, a graveyard and look at the tombstones, they can't believe the dates on the tombstones yeah. that they see in the graveyards. All right, uh, uh, does that mean, uh, because the history of the West is relatively recent, does that mean that, that they're not interested in people in Ontario and the history of Ontario? Well, no, that's not true. Look, most of the people in... Uh, in uh, Vancouver, have close friends in Toronto. Well, I wasn't so much thinking of the not being close to the people in Ontario, but not being able to fully appreciate the conflict, the French-English conflict that Ontario and Quebec have lived yeah. with much longer. That's all I was suggesting. There. Mike, it's very difficult for uh, people my age or younger than my age to appreciate that properly when we went through an entire school system where it was almost never ever talked about. And when you're, when you're producing kids today who come out of... Um, <laughs> grade 12 and grade 13. And if 70% of the kids, in, uh, as my recent school survey indicated, have never ever heard of the name René Levesque, how do you expect them to know very much about the business of Quebec right. and Confederation? That could explain why you're quoted as saying, before traveling, I'd never realized that I had a great love for Canada. Mm -hmm. That only came recently. Well, it's quite true. In all of my education, I didn't have any background or perspective of Canada. There was nothing in my family life or in my personal life, and God knows there was nothing in my education to teach me anything at all about this country. I came out of school knowing almost nothing about the country, and I, sure, traveled a little bit. It wasn't until I really began to travel from one end of the country to the other and to see Canadians and to realize what an incredibly great country this is and what a marvelous potential this country is that I realized what a sad thing it was that we were throwing it away the way we were. But until you begin to travel the country, like uh, that's nothing, there's nothing better than for a group of Saskatchewan farm kids to go and spend a week in the province of Quebec and vice versa. That's a really good way in which you'll, you'll diminish any problems that we have in this country about, about excessive regionalism. Regionalism in itself is a healthy thing, and there's a growing trend towards it. But we have had so many crummy politicians battling each other on the basis of their provincial rights and always making Ottawa the scapegoat that I'm afraid uh, in the absence of strong leadership, and we haven't had strong leadership in Ottawa for a long, long time, it's just been getting worse and worse. Do you see this trend towards stronger regionalism as an unhealthy thing? Well, <clears throat> you can look at it two ways. I really do like to see the decision-making closer to the people rather than right. being centralized. Like every time I go to Ottawa, and I spend an awful lot of time in Ottawa, I love the city. It's an exciting city in many ways. But I can't believe how many of the top senior civil servants and the politicians that I know there are in, so incredibly out of touch with the reality of what right. the country is all about. Having said that, let me assure you that there's nothing more that the big multinational corporations would like than to see the balkanization of this country, than to see so strong provincial rights that there's no possible way that you can manage it as a cohesive country. So that works in their favor than the regionalization? Oh, sure. There's nothing that the multinational corporations like better than pitting Saskatchewan against Manitoba for a new pulp mill or pitting Alberta against <coughs> British Columbia for new natural gas uh, royalty policies. Divide and conquer. Of course. 
From the fur business into the publishing business, and you wanted to become a publisher with a message, or a message publisher. Because it wasn't only traveling, Mel, it was also reading about this country that uh, kind of got the flames uh, of Canadianism going in you. Did you become a publisher with a message? Well, I was a bookseller, you know, for 17 years before I became a book uh, publisher. I only became a book publisher full-time in 1972, but I started off with a very small bookstore. Mike, we, we had so few books, and I had so little money when we started that we had to take the books and turn them face out on the shelves to make them look full, to make the bookshelves look full in the store. But I found publishing uh, was very exciting. I published uh, a book in 1967, and it sold 50,000 copies. And I thought, wow, that's not bad. That's uh, kind of interesting. Uh, this is a country, you know, where you can get on the Canadian bestseller list with 5,000 copies. Right. The second book we published won the Governor General's Award for Poetry, and obviously it was very attractive. We were very lucky when we started. What was the message you wanted to get across in publishing? Well, do you know, believe it or not, I didn't really have a message to begin with. Um, sure, I do publish books with a message, but we publish gardening books, and we publish cookbooks, and we publish books of Eskimo art and this sort of thing. But on the other hand, we do publish a lot of books in my area, and my area has to do with the idea that uh, this is a really good place for human beings to live, and let's stop selling it out so that other people can decide our life pattern okay. and the way we live. So you felt the, the traveling back and forth and reading that the country was being sold out. We were throwing something great away. In 1967, you saw Trudeau. You organized the first political campaign outside of Montreal mm -hmm. uh, to get him. He was justice minister then, I think. That's okay? right to get him elected, or at least leading the party. What did you see in him that you thought this man might reverse the trend? Well, if you remember back to the early 60s and mid-60s, there was this long period of time where Mr. Pearson and Mr. Diefenbaker were battling in minority governments in the House of right. Commons. There was tremendous boredom and apathy. There was lack <clears throat> of leadership. The country was really drifting. Um, I went to Quebec. Mike in the middle of 67 during the centennial celebrations and uh, I came back really quite frightened because all of my Anglo-Saxon friends, all of my Catholic friends, all of my Jewish friends, all of my Quebecois friends, they all told me the same thing. They told me that there's absolutely no question of a doubt that Quebec is going to separate and Quebec is going to leave Confederation. And I didn't see any leadership coming from anyone at that particular time. Along came this marvelous, charismatic, exciting fascinating man who'd been in the background. He was fresh, he was new, he was fully bilingual, he was articulate, he was kind of jazzy because he wore leather jackets and he rode on motorcycles and stuff like that. And the image uh, that was projected of him, especially by the media, was, was marvelous. Meet him in person, one of the most attractive, one of the most interesting, one of the brightest people you'll ever meet. So here it seemed to me was a chance for a new leadership, a chance to keep Quebec in Confederation and uh, so we went to work for him. We went to work very hard for him, in fact. Five years later, you broke with him, Mel. Why? Yes, well, uh, you see, I worked very hard in the Liberal Party, and I was very naive, like, politically. God, I, I knew so little about politics. Well, again, I was like the average graduate of an average Canadian school. The most important change that I would like to make in the curriculums of, of schools across the country is to, if you want the kids to go out and play a normal role in society, and play an active role in society, I should say, you've got to teach them how the political system works. And they don't. Like the kids who leave grade 12 and grade 13 across this country have absolutely beans all idea about how politics, politics works. So I was in that position. I was totally naive. And uh, I really thought if I went into the Liberal Party and a whole bunch of my friends across the country went into the Liberal Party, and we worked very hard. I became a member of the Liberal Party's National Policy Committee. I was at the Prime Minister's home quite often. I was at his office quite often. and. Uh, he and I got to know each other quite well. I thought that we could really make a change in the Liberal Party, despite its long history, and we, we could get them to stop. Uh, Walter Gordon thought the same thing. Many other people in the Liberal Party thought the same thing. We could get them to stop the increasing growth of foreign ownership in our country. Worked very hard, batted my head against the wall for a number of years, and uh, realized in 1973 that there is no way that the Liberal Party is going to make any significant changes of that kind. Because they can't? Well, I'm going to have to give you a very blunt answer. I'm not sure you're going to like the answer, because in my perception, the Liberal Party, as I know it, and having worked in it for a great number of years, is 
essentially a party of big business. Very few people in Canada, Mike, belong to any political party. It's one of the great tragedies in our country. Everybody should read Chapter 12 of John Porter's book, The Vertical Mosaic. John Porter explains how Canada is really an incredibly democratic country in theory. And in practice, <clears throat> there is a very small political and economic elite who really manipulate and run things. And uh, I know that sounds like a terribly cynical point of view, but it's the point of view that I've come across after being quite active in politics. If for you've a number seen of years. The, the Liberal Party is in the hands of big business, do the Conservative Party offer an alternative? <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid not. I, I'm not in favor of any party right now, Mike. And again, I don't like being, being excessively negative. I see the conservatives and, and the liberals in power. I think if you examine the last 20 years of the only two parties that have ever governed this country, you'll find that essentially in power, their policies are almost indistinguishable. Both of them have been allowing foreign ownership to grow at a graph that looks like this so that every day there's new Canadian natural resources, every day there's new Canadian businesses. Every day, the Bay of Fundy Coast and the Great Lakes shoreline in Ontario and the ranch land in British Columbia and the Gulf Islands in BC and hundreds of thousands of acres of farmland in Alberta are being sold. My question that I always, always ask, you know, if we keep doing this, for God's sake, what is going to be left to the kids of this country? Yeah. Now, you, you would agree that your argument or your attack isn't just against the federal government. You've got <coughs> enemies then in, in every province in the provincial governments, too. You've got enemies in the Canadian business sector that well, will sell out to also. We don't... I mean, there's a lot of Canadians that are responsible for this, just other than the Trudeaus and the Liberal government. Isn't that true? I've always said that it's not, it's never been a question of, of rape, it's been a question of prostitution, if I can make that pretty important distinction. So you don't ever blame Americans, you don't ever blame people from God knows where for buying up our country. You blame our own business community and you blame our own politicians for allowing it to happen. Mike, uh, it's not just as if it's an incidental little casual thing that I'm talking about. It's something we've been debating in this country for the last 25 years. And while we've, as polite little Canadians, have been debating it, Ever since 11 years ago when George Grant told us in his book, Lament for a Nation, it's already too late to do anything about it. Since then, foreign ownership has doubled. Let me put it to you in this very, very simple and graphic way. If you take all of the foreign ownership that exists in all of Spain, all of Portugal, all of Italy, all of France, all of Switzerland, all of West Germany, all of Holland, all of Belgium, all of Luxembourg, all of Denmark, all of Northern Ireland and Ireland, and then throw in for good measure Scotland and England, and throw in Norway and Sweden and Finland, throw in for good measure all of Japan, you get the amount of foreign ownership that exists in good old patriotic Canada, and that amount's going up on a graph that looks like this every year. Mel, in 1972 you ran for the Liberal Party out in Edmonton, east or west, I don't remember which. You lost. What was your platform? Did you have a, a plan? Did you have a Mm -hmm. Were you bucking the, the liberal <coughs> tradition? Well, it was a terrific experience for me. I'd never run for elected office before. And the first thing I decided to do, Mike, is having worked in the party for a while and I'm not liking the, what I saw about the way money was raised, is we decided that we would have an open campaign. Now, what did that mean? Well, it meant, I think we were the first people really in the country to really make that an important issue. Uh, it meant that we disclosed all the sources of our campaign donations. We didn't accept more than $1,000 from anybody, and we also, at the same time, couldn't accept any money from the Liberal Party because we said we're not going to accept any money from foreign corporations. We're not going to accept money from people who won't tell us who gave us the money. <coughs> so it would be hypocritical then to take money from the Liberal Party. It meant that we had very little money. We were running in one of the largest constituencies in all of Canada with well over, a, I guess it was 120,000 voters at that particular time. So it meant that we had to have a people-intensive campaign. My campaign manager was a former football coach, the former coach of the University of Alberta Golden Bear football team, who'd never, ever been active in politics before. Had a marvelous people-intensive campaign. 1,100 people working in the campaign. I, I myself called on over 9,000 homes door-to-door. -door, and it was a great experience. We lost because anybody, as I said, uh, Time magazine, that, that famous magazine, quoted me, uh, after the election, if my name had been Jesus Christ or Phil Esposito, I couldn't have won uh, running for the Liberals at the time. Politics is 
very largely a sense of timing. And whatever I had, I had lousy timing. Lousy timing. <laughs> Terrible. I have to move you on, Mel. You became chairman of the Committee for an Independent Canada after yeah. that. Uh, there was a flourish and an interest and a passion. Last year in your meeting, you had 68 members of the, mm -hmm. of the group or committee at the, at the meeting in Nova Scotia. What's that mean, 68 members? Is, is it too late? Has the mood passed? Has the time gone? Well, there's a couple of very important questions in, in, that you've just raised. Number one, number one has to do with that famous meeting in Lunenburg where, where everybody reported about a small attendance we had. We made a very bad strategic move to have our annual meeting in Lunenburg in the middle of September. Who can go to Lunenburg on September the 15th? It was just simply a bad mistake. Yeah, but still, beyond that, yep. there is, it is a calmer period now. There isn't as much talk about buying back Canada as there was a year or two <clears throat> years ago in this recession that we've been through and whatnot. Don't you agree? I think, uh, I think the media has uh, lost a little bit of the excitement that they had for the issue of Canadian, so-called Canadian nationalism. I've always said it's not nationalism, really. We're really sim when you talk about not selling your home, you can always be friendly with your neighbor, but you don't have to sell them your house. Right. I, don't think, <laughs> I, don't, I really don't think that that's nationalism. Uh, Mike, there's another problem. As every day goes by, let me put it this way. A man who has a wife and children, and that man has got uh, mortgage payments to make, and he's got insurance premiums to pay, and he's got automobile pay payments to make, and he works for IBM, or works for General Motors, or works for Chrysler, or works for Safeway, or Kodak. That man is not going to go to a public meeting and stand up and say, hey, we've got to stop the growth of foreign ownership in Canada. His wife isn't going to write a letter to the editor. Their kids are going to be pretty silent on the issue. Yeah, because what's very fundamental is a job. Okay, so as every day goes by and more and more Canadians are placed in the position where they're dependent on these big foreign companies, there's less and less of an anguish about, about Canadian nationalism, at least publicly. Having said that, what about the enormous contradiction of the Gallup polls? In the last Gallup poll, 71% of Canadians said that they didn't want any further foreign ownership. Only 16% said that they did. That's an enormous turnaround over the last five years. What's next for Mel Hurting? A political party? I, I entitle this uh, discussion of politician without a home. <clears throat> Mike, anybody who knows politics in this country knows that it's absolutely insane and impossible and ridiculous, absurd to think in terms of a new party. And yet I must tell you that many of us across the country are thinking about it. We think that maybe a party that would uh, talk in terms of open government, complete access by the public to the government's working documents. After all, the politicians and the civil servants are supposed to be a tool of the people. I just can't believe the way we have closed shop in the, in the government in Ottawa and at the provincial level as well. Okay, a government, a, a party a that stood for open, o open, open government. government. A progressive tax system, a really progressive tax system. I think it's absurd that the lower 20% of our population pays as much percentage-wise in direct and indirect taxes, that's the two kinds of taxes, as do the upper 20%. I really think, uh, again, I'm echoing here an American, Jimmy Carter, I think has got some pretty good ideas on, on this subject. Uh, a, a, a party that was really dedicated to the idea that women should play a greater role in Canadian society, I think that would be a great party. And a party that said, look, we're not nationalists, we're not aggressive, we're not anti-American or anything like that, but we do believe that in our own country we should be masters in our own house and we're going to stop selling out this country. I think that's a pretty good basis for a party. And do you feel there's, there's a possibility or is it just a dream? It's just a dream right now, Mike. It's something we're talking about. Uh, uh, ask me in uh, a year from now and maybe I'll be able to give you a better answer. How about you and Pierre Elliott Trudeau? You, he calls you once to thorn in his flesh or in his side or something. Are you still on speaking terms? I haven't seen the Prime Minister or talked to him now, Mike, for several years, I'm afraid. Oh, really? And uh, he doesn't call me, and uh, I haven't called him. <laughs> <sighs> it isn't all his fault, as you said. Well, uh, I'll let you uh, cast an opinion on that.
Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.